Well, we come now to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 15 to 29. And if you're familiar at all with this text, you know immediately that there are a couple of places in these verses that are, that are difficult to, to, to interpret, particularly verses 16 and 17, and we're going to get into that. But one of the things that that difficulty automatically does is it reminds us of our limits. Uh, we, are, we are limited in our understanding and so far removed from that original context that There are portions of Scripture, as we will see this evening, that appear to be obscure and difficult for our understanding. And certainly, if the Apostle Peter could say that about the writings of the Apostle Paul, then we are comforted in the fact that we experience that same kind of struggle when we approach the book of Ecclesiastes. And yet, as we Look at the text this evening, and I trust as we dig down deeper into it, the Lord will give us understanding. There is some very, very profound truth to grasp in this particular section, and from that draw some very, very apropos implications for our lives today. So turn in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes 7. We will be looking at verses 15 through 29, and the title is Know Your Limits. Now, when we talk about limits, obviously, we are talking about creaturely limitations, limitations also in us due to our own sinful biases. Limitations are those things which challenge our pride. They are things which humble us, and yet as men, we certainly like to fight back against limitations. And that desire to fight back against limitations can be a good thing, but as we will see this evening, often our fighting back against the limitations upon us, whether due to our creatureliness or due to our sinfulness, evidences uh, the basic sin of pride. How do we define pride? I, I like how Stephen Charnock captured what pride is, when he defined it this way, he said, pride is self-contending with God for preeminence. Pride is self-contending with God for preeminence. Now, all of us struggle with pride. It is part of the flesh that still remains with us, even as believers. It's at the root of that sinful flesh, that desire to have first place, All of us struggle with it. Few of us would define our own pride as contending with God, and yet that is what it is. When we look back to the very first sin, the original sin of mankind, when we look back to Genesis chapter 3, we see that ultimately Eve and then Adam were tempted by the idea of being like God. And in the temptation of the serpent, there was the challenge that was made to both the clarity and the veracity of God's word. And Satan invited Eve and then Adam to put themselves as judges over God's word. And Satan, when you look at Genesis 3, Satan tempted them. And then you find in verse 16 of, or excuse me, verse 6 of chapter 3, that the woman, Eve, saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from its fruit and ate and she gave it also to her husband and he ate. Keep that idea in mind. She looked at the fruit, saw it was pleasing and it was pleasing particularly in that it would make her wise. It would make her, as far as Satan's temptation was conceived, it would make her like God. And that has been the problem of mankind ever since. We have sought independence from God in our own thinking. Uh, We believe our own rationality, our own minds, to be capable of prescribing for ourselves that which is best, of understanding and and asserting that which is good for us. And yet, as we're seeing in the book of Ecclesiastes itself, this is one of man's biggest problems. 
As we saw last time, man does not know what is good for him. And we left off in our study last time in Ecclesiastes 7, looking particularly at verses 13 and 14. And as Solomon ended that particular section, as he told us to learn from the dead and then to learn from the wise and then to learn from the creator, he left us with these verses at the end of that section when he said this. He said, consider the work of God for who is able to straighten what he has bent. In the day of prosperity, be happy, but in the day of absurd, uh, of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other so that men will not discover anything that will be after him. Now the key idea there is that God has made certain things bent and we cannot straighten them. In the context, that is a reference to adversity. God has, due to the curse, has bent our circumstances. Not all of them, but some of them. He goes on to say then in the previous, or in the next verse, he goes on to say that there will be the day of prosperity, but there will also be the day of adversity. God has bent our circumstances. Now, how we respond to that reality is crucially important. How do you respond to adversity? How do you respond to the bent circumstances in your life? That defines you. And that certainly is the topic that Solomon picks up as he goes into verse 15. In fact, he carries on this idea of the bent circumstances and the sovereignty of God and our response to it all the way from verse 15 to verse 29. And through this section, he reminds us over and over again, O man, even O righteous man, know your limits. Know your limits. This is crucial for successful living in this world. And he's going to teach us four lessons about our limits. These are the four. First of all, that there are crooked things that you cannot straighten. Secondly, there is a righteous perfection That you cannot claim. Thirdly, there are transcendent mysteries you cannot explain. And then fourth, there is a depraved disposition that you cannot deny. Let's look at the first of these. And it's found in verses 15 through 18. There are crooked things you cannot straighten. Men, know your limits. There are crooked things you cannot straighten. He says this in these verses. I have seen everything during my lifetime of futility. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. Do not be excessively righteous, and do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin yourself? Do not be excessively wicked, and do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you grasp the one thing and also not let go of the other, for the one who fears God comes forth with both of them. And now, as I said, those words in particular, that section of our our study this evening, and In particular, verses 16 and 17 have elicited no small amount of debate. One commentator says this, Few verses in all of Ecclesiastes are more subject to incorrect interpretations than chapter 7, verses 16 through 18. When Solomon says, Do not be excessively righteous and do not be overly wise. What does he mean when he says, do not, in verse 17, be excessively wicked and do not be a fool? What does he mean? In fact, I was just asked this question a week ago. Someone heard that I was teaching on Ecclesiastes and their first question was, what do these verses mean? Well, let's look at some of the proposals that have been made by interpreters about these verses. One of the proposals is this, that Solomon is expressing what can be called the cynic's logic. And according to this view, Solomon is actually 
stepping away from any kind of biblical faith and is thinking completely like a natural man. He's contemplating about life without any reference to God whatsoever. That's one view, and it doesn't fit. It doesn't work. Another view that has quite a few proponents is the view that says that Solomon, or actually someone other than Solomon, is proposing what's called the golden mean, the golden average, or the golden level of balance. And this view is particularly popular among commentators who say that the book of Ecclesiastes wasn't written in the 10th century BC, in the time of Solomon. It was written instead during the time of the great Hellenistic philosophers by someone else very different than Solomon. In fact, Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, did advocate what is called the golden mean. In fact, he said this. He said, virtue lies in a mean between opposite extremes. And he bases his ethical system upon that. Other Greek philosophers such as Zeno followed that up with the whole school of Stoicism to say that the best path in life, the the one that will yield you the best results is to avoid either excessive righteousness or excessive foolishness. This view would say that Solomon or whoever writes this book is counseling against what one writer says, too goody-goody or too impossibly naughty. That both options are just not good for, for a man's life. There are better options. Those ones are quite extreme. But there's one that sees these verses as a warning against fanaticism. Some commentators look at verses 16 and 17 and say that the preacher here, Solomon perhaps, if they take, him, uh, take Solomon as the author of this book, say that, that he is counseling his, his readers to avoid extremism. You could say to avoid legalism, to avoid that pursuit of perfection that is nonstop striving. Because after all, this kind of non-stop striving takes a definite toll on a person's mental health, their emotional health, their spiritual health, and even their physical health. It leads them, as Solomon says here, to ruin. So it is against what you could even say is Pharisaism. There's still another view, and it's that Solomon is providing a warning here against self-righteousness. That when we read verse 16 and the idea of being excessively righteous and overly wise, Solomon is warning against seeing yourself, against evaluating yourself more highly than you ought. He's warning against seeing yourself as wise in your own eyes, which Solomon back in Proverbs 3 warns against in verse 7, do not be wise in your own eyes. And so in this case, Solomon is providing this instruction against a kind of lifestyle that is hypocritical, which sees a lot of external righteousness, but internal, internally is, is just not righteous. It's a kind of righteousness that is based on one's own personal standards and not on true righteousness. Now, however we take these verses, it is important to note that the right conclusion the right interpretation has to take into account the two verses that surround these debated verses. This is a whole paragraph. It begins in verse 15 and it ends in verse 18. So whatever is taught in verses 16 and 17 must fit with verse 15 and verse 18. And when we look at those two outer verses, we see a a kind of logic that actually develops and leads us to what I think is the best way to understand these verses. Let's look at and trace the logic of this text. First of all, in verse 15, you could see or you could summarize the verse this way, a disturbing reality observed, a disturbing reality observed. Solomon says this, I have seen everything during my lifetime of futility There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked 
man who prolongs his life in wickedness. Now Solomon here is making an assessment that is based on observation. He's not saying this is based on principle. He's saying it is based on observation, on on what he has been able to see through a lifetime of observation. And it's very extensive at that. And what he notices here is that life doesn't conform as we would expect it to in every situation to what is called the doctrine or the law of retribution. Now what's that? Well, the Mosaic Law, for example, said that if you do this and you obey the law and you follow the statutes, you will enjoy a long life. But if you disobey, you will, in, you, your life will be cut short. So, for example, Deuteronomy chapter 5.33 says this, You shall walk in all the way which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you will possess. Conversely, Deuteronomy 30, verses 17 to 18 says, But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land where you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. So in the book of Deuteronomy, there's reminders over and over again of this law of retribution. That you obey and things will go well. You disobey and and you will be punished. And Solomon looks at that and says, okay, but when I observe the world around me, I see bent circumstances. I see the righteous man receiving both days of prosperity and days of adversity. In fact, as he says in verse 15, I see the righteous man dying before his time, and I see the wicked man living long years. This also was against the standard principles of what we call traditional wisdom, the wisdom that we find in the book of Proverbs. For example, Proverbs 10 verse 27 says, the fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. So what's going on here? This is the the challenge that Solomon is, is dealing with. Now he himself contributed most of the book of Proverbs. So, so why the seeming apparent contradiction? First of all, it's important to notice that the book of Proverbs is that traditional wisdom. It's proverbial wisdom. The book of Proverbs attempts to summarize important principles for life in very short, pithy statements. But the book of Proverbs is not intended to deal with all circumstances. It is intended to deal with the general principles. The book of of Ecclesiastes, however, is intended to deal with the exceptions. The book of Ecclesiastes struggles at at the thinking of the same writer as the book of Proverbs, struggles with the exceptions to the rules. Those exceptions are the bent circumstances. Those exceptions are the days of adversity. For the righteous man, those exceptions are the prolonged life for the wicked. And Solomon here is observing this reality. He sees that God has bent certain things. That he sends both days of adversity and days of prosperity upon righteous men. And in some cases, God even takes the life of righteous men prematurely. That's the reality expressed in verse 15. One writer summarizes it this way. In spite of their righteous character, some men die young. And in spite of their wickedness, some evil men live long, prosperous lives. Righteousness does not necessarily bring prosperity, and wickedness does not necessarily bring suffering and death. And we all ourselves have observed that. And it's not the only place, even in the scriptures, where that is detailed. Look at Psalm 73 and the struggle of Asaph who who wrestles with the same reality. Why, Lord, do the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? 
That's the same issue that Solomon is dealing with. So with that in mind now, we enter verse 16. He has given us an observation. Now he gives us a predictable reaction. A predictable reaction, but it's one that he denounces. And that reaction is going to be seen as as two sides of, of a coin. He's going to express it in two different ways, once in verse 16 and once in verse 17. First of all, here's one predictable reaction. Do not be excessively righteous and do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin yourself? What Solomon is emphasizing here as he deals with wrong reactions to the bent circumstances of life, he's referring first of all, he's, he's warning first of all, those who would try to subvert the bent circumstances. Those who would try to subvert the reality of verse 15. He's dealing with those who would say, if I just strive harder, if I do better, if I can defy the exceptions, I, I, I can then, I can avert adversity and I can extend my life. This is the response of those who think that when adversity comes, they just need to pull themselves up, they need to do better, and some way they will outrun the calamity. Solomon first deals with that and says, that is not the proper response to adversity. That's not the proper response to the possibility of an early death. You cannot outrun it. Solomon's counsel here, his his warning, is for those with a high view of their own ability, who who place great confidence in their flesh, and who determine, according to their own abilities, because they're worth it, they determine to try to outrun the adversity. Solomon says, no matter how hard you try in your action of excessive righteousness, And your activity of outthinking God, no matter how hard you try, you cannot straighten what God has bent. In fact, the harder you try, Solomon says, you'll make things worse. You will ruin yourself. That's not an option. He deals with another option then in verse 17. He says, do not be excessively wicked. And do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? Now Solomon responds to another inappropriate reaction to the reality of verse 15. And the death of the righteous and the prosperity of the wicked. Solomon says, wait a minute. Don't try to take advantage of those bent circumstances. Don't be an opportunist. Some would say this, since the righteous die young, and since the wicked can live long, what matter does it make? What difference? Sin won't kill me, so let me press into it. God has bent the circumstances, so it doesn't matter what I do. Solomon's counsel here is for the opportunist to the fatalist you might say, who looks at these exceptions in life and says, it's unpredictable, so it doesn't matter. So let me lean into that which is natural to me. Why am I resisting sin? If it's not going to prolong my life, if it's not going to keep away adversity, why stop it? Why resist it? Solomon says, listen, a plunge into That recklessness will not turn out for good. In fact, eventually, he says, you will die. Eventually, that doctrine of retribution, eventually, that law of retribution will eventually catch up to you. You can't outrun it. And that's now what leads us to verse 18. So what is the proper response? When we see that the righteous die young and the wicked prosper, when we see the days of adversity and the days of prosperity given to both the wicked and the righteous, how do we respond? Solomon says, here's the proper response prescribed. Verse 18, 
It is good that you grasp one thing and not let go of the other. For the one who fears God comes forth with both of them. Solomon commends the ability here to grasp the dangers, to to understand the dangers represented in both verse 16 and verse 18. Verse Verse 17. Verse 16 emphasized overconfidence. Verse 17 emphasized fatalism. Solomon says it is good to grasp both realities. Don't fall into either one. Don't fall into the left ditch or the right ditch. And instead, he says, here is what you're after. Rather than being overly righteous in your efforts to avoid adversity, rather than plunging yourself into sin, be exceedingly fearful. The fear of God here is of a fundamentally different nature than the activities of being overly wise and being exceedingly righteous. You see, being wise and being righteous are things that we do. You could call them works. But what Solomon prescribes here is not a life that that, that seeks to go through the adversity of life based on one's own fleshly striving and activities. Instead, to go through life, a life outside the garden, a life under the curse, in a world that groans, in a life of adversity where sometimes the righteous die very untimely deaths, he says the right way is to walk by faith. He says, fear God. That's where you need to excel. This fear of God is is not a cynical view of life, nor is it a golden mean average between righteousness and wickedness. Instead, The fear of God here we can define as this. I like the the definition given by Charles Bridges. He said, it is that affectionate reverence by which the child of God bends himself humbly and carefully to his father's law. That's the fear of God. Notice the components. It is an affectionate reverence. It's a humble bowing, a submission a surrender of one's own will and strategies and strivings and a submission to carefully follow the Father's law. And I might add this, the Father's law is not only what he has recorded in this book. The Father's law is also the mystery of his providence. The Father's law is the decree that he has made for your life that secret decree, those plans for you that are not recorded in this work but come to you day after day through your circumstances, the fear of God leads you in humility to bow before mysterious providences. Don't try to subvert it. Don't try to take advantage of the unpredictability. Submit. Know your limits, pursue humility. There's a second limit that we must recognize here, and it's found in verses 19 through 22. There is a righteous perfection you cannot claim. A righteous perfection you cannot claim. Solomon says this, Wisdom strengthens a wise man more than ten rulers who are in a city. Indeed, There is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. Also, do not take seriously all words which are spoken so that you will not hear your servant cursing you. For you also have realized that you likewise have many times cursed others. Now, to some extent, some look at this and think there's no smooth flow to what Solomon is is teaching here. Instead, it's this combination or collection of various sayings, but there is certainly a flow to it. What Solomon wants us to recognize, first of all, even though he has said there is a limit to wisdom, that fear is, is what you ultimately need, he doesn't want you to disband with wisdom altogether. And so he begins by extolling the value of wisdom. It does provide an advantage for you. Verse 
19, wisdom strengthens a wise man, more than 10 rulers. A wise man can have more benefit and be strengthened more than the collective intelligence of 10 city rulers. But before you go too far, Solomon's purpose here isn't now to to go on and extol all of wisdom's virtues. There are limits to wisdom, and now he gets to that in the next verse. He says this, indeed... There is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. There is a limitation to this wisdom, he says. He's speaking to us realistically. There is a limitation, and this is the limitation. Wisdom cannot erase the stark reality of what we call total or universal depravity. It can't eliminate the presence of sin in this world. It can't eliminate the consequences of that sin in this world. In fact, it cannot, wisdom cannot bring you in this life perfection. What is total depravity? You can define it this way. John MacArthur and Richard Mayhew in the book Biblical Doctrine provide this definition. Total depravity is the belief that humans begin life with all aspects of their nature corrupted by the effects of sin. Thus, all their actions will lack totally pure motives. This does not mean, of course, that they are as wicked as they possibly can be. But notice Solomon's emphasis here. He says, there is not a righteous man on this earth. There's not a righteous man. it, It echoes what The psalmist says in Psalm 14, verses 1 and 3, there is no one who does good, there is no one who does good, not even one. Solomon himself said this as he dedicated the temple. He said in 1 Kings 8, verse 46, for there is no man who does not sin. And in Romans 3, verse 10, in that beginning of that key section in Paul's letter to the Romans on the doctrine of total depravity, Paul says this, there is none righteous, not even one, which is perhaps the only place where Ecclesiastes is possibly cited in the New Testament. We're not sure whether Paul is citing Psalm 14 or Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20. But the idea is is straightforward. There's not a righteous man on earth. You cannot claim that righteous standard for yourself. Know your limits. He also goes on to say this, do not take seriously all words which are spoken so that you will not hear your servant cursing you, for you you also have realized that you likewise have many times cursed others. To develop this recognition of depravity and the effects of sin on us, Solomon goes to that place where where sin is is most evident, most rampant, most destructive. Sins of the tongue. We even know that from James 3, don't we? James 3 verse 2 says, we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. Now we all sin through our mouths. And in The rest of that chapter in James, he goes on to say how we will bless God and curse men with that same tongue. So Solomon takes that same idea and says, look, this is the illustration of the fact that you are not righteous. He uses the idea of to curse, which means to declare something as contemptible. And he, he points to an irony of offendedness here. What's interesting is that he does look to two different social standings, the master and the servant. And he's addressing the master and he's saying, don't listen to when your servant curses you. And you might ask, well, why, why would he say that? Shouldn't there be some level of authority? And Solomon says, no, you know what? You do the very same sin. Even though you are of a different social status, you engage in the very same thing. What Solomon is pointing to here is, is that offendedness that so often characterizes us. Someone slanders us. Someone speaks evil of us. And we get so offended. We get so worked up. And usually those who get offended most are the biggest violators 
Usually those who feel so angry that others would slander them are those who commit the most sins of the mouth. William Barrick says this, the individual who is acutely aware of his or her own sinfulness will more readily shrug off the foolish and unkind remarks of others. And I've found that in dealing with men, that sometimes I want to say, methinks thou dost protest too much. I think you're overdoing this. I think you're, you're protesting too much because, boy, in the last five minutes, you have slandered the person who slandered you far worse than what he said about you. We cannot claim this righteous perfection. In fact, as Solomon says, we need to be those who would respond and say, oh yeah, you think what you said about me was evil? You should listen to my own conscience. And it says far worse than what you just said. So you know what? No harm, no foul against me. I'm worse than what you said. Know your limits. Thirdly, here's another limit. There are transcendent mysteries you cannot explain. Not only are there crooked things you cannot straighten, not only is there a righteous perfection you cannot claim, but men, there are transcendent mysteries you cannot explain. Verses 23 to 26 cover this. He says this, I tested all this with wisdom, and I said, I will be wise. But it was far from me. What has been is remote and exceedingly mysterious. Who can discover it? I directed my mind to know, to investigate, and to seek wisdom and explanation, and to know the evil of folly and the foolishness of madness. And I discovered more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are chains. One who is pleasing to God will escape from her, but the sinner will be captured by her. Now again, these These verses contain what is another very challenging interpretive issue. We'll get there in just a moment. But before we do, notice this. Solomon describes how he himself, for a time, sought this exceeding wisdom. He said, I'm now going to be wise. He sought to subvert the limits. He, He sought to pursue a state of wisdom that could make sense of all the crooked things in life. But he confesses that this pursuit was a dead end. He says that these things were exceedingly mysterious, emphasizing the fact that they cannot be solved. You cannot explain some things. In fact, by Solomon's account, there are a lot of things in life that you just cannot explain. And Solomon brings us then to that rhetorical question which each one of us must come to and answer the the, the correct way. He says at the end of verse 24, who can discover it? Who can lay it bare? Who can explain it? Who can explain God's mysterious providences in life? Why he takes one and not the other? Why he allows the wicked man to live a prosperous life and yet takes uh, the, the, the righteous man in, in youth? Why one person gets cancer and the other doesn't? Why one lives a prolific life and, 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 and enjoys what seems to be a long life and the other one who's pursuing righteousness and he's humble and yet he's always in poverty, he's always facing hardship. How can you explain that? And Solomon says, who can discover this? The answer is no one. Not you, not man. These are mysteries. And as Moses himself said in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the, the secret things belong to God. And so much of life is coming to the point where you embrace that and not only grin and bear it, but lovingly, adoringly submit and bend underneath that reality. Now, he says he directed his mind to know and to investigate and 
to seek. And again, this speaks of his endeavor. This also is important to note that Solomon already was one who surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the East and the wisdom of Egypt, 1 Kings 4.30. And yet he sought more. He wanted to see it from all perspectives. And one commentator describes his efforts with these words. The image conjured up for us is that of a merchant or accountant pouring over the documents, trying to give an account of every item, perhaps to assign everything to one side or the other side of the ledger, and then to tally it all up in order to arrive at the right balance. But here's the reality. Solomon is never able to get the right balance. Not only does he not know which side of the ledger to put these different circumstances on, but no matter how he adds them up, they don't come to the total that he thinks they should. His effort was fruitless. Now, in verse 26, we have these challenging words. He talks about discovering something more bitter than death, and that's the woman whose heart is snares and nets. Now, this This identity of this woman is is largely debated. On the one hand, it could actually refer to a harlot, the kind of woman that Solomon describes in places like Proverbs 5 and and Proverbs 7. But the problem is Solomon has has not been talking about women in this sense for quite some time. You have to go back to chapter 2. He has nothing in the context to suggest relations with women. So there's another, probably better way to look at this. This woman is is a figurative harlot. And for this, we go back also to the book of Proverbs, to chapter 9, verse 13 to 18. You can read them later, but there Solomon personifies folly. It's, It's Madame Folly. The one who is very much like a, a real prostitute, but this is folly. This is one who invites in the figurative sense to the same kind of snares and and traps and chains. And essentially what Solomon is saying here is, is that in his endeavor to try to figure these things out. He pushed himself so hard, he, 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 he ended up at the doorstep of folly. He ended up at the doorstep of Madame Folly, and she was inviting him in. And it was only by the grace of God that he escaped. He said, one who is pleasing to God will escape from her, but the sinner will surely be captured. The sinner can't handle these things. The sinner will just give up and give in. That leads us to a final limit to recognize, and it's found in the final verses of this chapter, the last three verses, there is a depraved disposition you cannot deny. Over and over, Solomon is hitting us with our limitations. He's humbling us. He's telling us of all our our inadequacies and insufficiencies, and this is the climax here. He says, behold, I've discovered this, says the preacher, adding one thing to another to find an explanation, which I am still seeking, but I have not found. I have found one man among a thousand, but I have not found a woman among all these. Behold, I have found only this, that God has made men upright, but they have sought many devices. We'll go through through this text fairly quickly as we conclude. But Solomon concludes this section by saying that he had sought to explain all of these bent things, all of life's enigmas and mysteries, but he had not been able to do it. He was yet to find it. In fact, we find in this text a verb that is repeated over and over and over again. I have discovered to find, have not found, I have found. I have not found. And you'll say it one more time in verse 29. I have found. He's talking about discovery here. And there is this flipping back and forth. Solomon has found certain things, but not other things. And the interplay between this 
discovery, this successful discovery on the one hand, and this unsuccessful defeat on the other, emphasizes this. Wisdom does have some benefit. Again, he is recognizing that wisdom will help. It it will provide you with some discoveries, but it has its limits. It will not solve everything. You will come to these cases where you will just say, I have not found an explanation. He says this then in in, in verses 27 20. He says, Behold, I have found only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. At the end, verse, verse 29 actually, God has made man upright, and they have sought out many devices. This is crucial. This is the culminating explanation. This is the thing that Solomon has found out for sure. And there is a word play in this section which is very important to capture. But let's start with the summary. Solomon says that God is righteous. Men are not. Solomon goes back to to Genesis 1 to 3 for the correct answer for this. We could read, for example, in chapter 1, verse 27, and then in chapter 1, verse 31, that God made man and woman in his own image, and then he pronounced it all very good. But then we read in chapter 3, verse 6, that the woman took of the fruit, ate it, and then... And then Adam ate too. And and so there you have Adam and Eve seeking out their own devices. He's going back once again to to that crucial section of Scripture which he bases so much of Ecclesiastes on. uh, Genesis chapter 3. But here's the profound play on words that we find in this very important conclusion of this chapter. Follow his wording. He says in verse 25, go back a little bit, he says he dedicated himself to seek wisdom and an explanation. He said then in verse 27 that he had put one thing to another to find an explanation. He then says in verse 28, he's still seeking even though he had not found. And then in verse 29, he identifies the whole problem of humanity, they have sought out many devices. I want you to notice this. Look at the verb sought. They have sought out many devices. Solomon uses that very same verb in verse 25 and 28 of his own search for answers. And then there is this word devices in verse 29. They, mankind, have sought out many devices. And we just typically translate that in our own minds as sins, immoralities. But that word there is a cognate to the word explanations. Very interesting interplay. And what Solomon is doing is is he's pointing us to the, the very root of our problems. It comes down to uh, the problem of Adam and Eve, the, the problem of all of their descendants, and even the problem of Solomon himself, that pride-fueled independence and the refusal to trust God. It came down to that root sin of trying to elevate oneself by thinking, I deserve a say. I deserve answers. I'm too good for this. I ought to be the master of my own soul. This is mankind's root sin. And it explains Solomon's dead ends. And in this powerful way is a confession, a recognition of his own limitations, his own moral, sinful limitations. Solomon recognized he could not deny the depravity that was still in his flesh. Now as we wrap up, let's think of applications to make from this text. First of all, number one, God's providential will 
is not a secret code that you can unlock with right performance. People will ask, what is God's will for my life? And oftentimes, that, that, that's, that's not a nefarious question. That's a, a real question, a, a helpful question. But often, the asking of that question can lapse into sinfulness. What is God's will for my life? Especially when it is asked when trials and adversities come, and we think then that I can do a certain kind of performance, and then God will unlock it for me. If I just perform and strive enough, God will reveal to me his providential will, and he'll take away the adversity, or he will explain why and give me peace for my soul. Solomon teaches that God's will is not a secret code that you can unlock by striving. Number two, fearing God is not an insurance policy against adversity or an untimely death. That's clear from these verses as well. Solomon doesn't say, I saw the righteous man die early, and, and then the, the right thing he should have done was fear God, and that would have solved his problem. No, it doesn't. The fear of God is not an insurance policy. You may still die an untimely death. You may still receive many days of adversity. But the fear of God is that, un, that, that affectionate reverence by which you, as a child of God, bend yourself humbly and carefully under God's revealed will and his secret will. And you trust. Third, wisdom will provide much advantage in this world, but realize this, wisdom has its limits. Wisdom is not the be-all, end-all men. Fearing God is. Wisdom provides advantages. It is needed. We want to cultivate it. We must recognize that it will not explain life's enigmas. Number four, the fear of God, that is reverential faith, is not about having all the answers, but is all about trusting in God's righteousness and wisdom, especially in adversity. There's one more lesson to draw, and it's this. You need a Savior to atone for your devices. Those devices that Solomon himself acknowledges in verse 29, the the devices that he ascribes to all men, despite the fact that God made them upright, they have sought out many devices. They're depraved. They need a Savior. And we're so thankful that there is. I'm taken to Isaiah 53, verse 6, which explains so much of what we've talked about so well. When Isaiah writes these words, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him, the suffering servant. He is the one who can atone for all of those devices. He is the one who can give you the faith that you need in the midst of adversity. Flee to him. Let's pray. Father, as we grapple with these words, we are certainly convicted of our pride and reminded of the need for humility which we cannot produce in ourselves. We pray that you would give us a greater fear of you, a greater reverential awe that would enable us more consistently and more sincerely to bow underneath your law, underneath your word, and and underneath your mysterious providence. That you would give us a greater faith to trust in your righteousness, to trust in your wisdom, 
especially in the days of adversity. We pray, Father, that you would give us the sincere language of the, uh, of, of the hymnist who, who wrote these words, Whatever my God ordains is right, his holy will abideth. I will be still whate'er he doth, and follow where he guideth. He is my God, though dark my road. He holds me that I shall not fall. And so to him I leave it all. He holds me that I shall not fall. Lord, give us that kind of fear. We ask it because you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen.